Brian Babbage wanted to kill his brother and sister. He found a way to mail a bomb in May, but not have it be delivered until August. It was quite brilliant, really. Yes, it was. Although by doing so, he violated two federal laws and a score of postal regulations. Go on. When I recently saw some wallpaper peeling off a wall, it reminded me of the ketchup bottles in Brian Babbage's closet. They were glued to the ceiling. The glue was the key. There was no glue in the bomb. It wasn't part of the bomb. It was part of the delivery mechanism. Exactly. It was an experiment, a stress test. The ketchup bottles weighed about the same as the mail bombs. He was trying to find out how long they would stick before they fell off. I don't get it. Tamil. Four months ago, Brian Babbage went around the city late at night, cracked open the panel on a couple of these mailboxes. These locks are pretty simple to pick. I've talked to my supervisors, but they don't listen. Tamil. Don't make waves. Tamil. Everybody just wants to hit their 20 and get out. I can take it from here. Brian put the bombs in the mailboxes, but he didn't put them on the bottom with the rest of the mail. He glued them to the top. You see, it's a blind spot. Nobody ever looks up there. Why would they? Four months later, the glue dries up, the bomb falls down, and the next day the mailman picks it up with the rest of the mail. It was like a time-released mail bomb. The US Post Office unwittingly became the messenger of evil. Who'd have thunk it? Well put, Tamil. By the time they were delivered, Brian had a perfect alibi. He put himself in a coma? That's his alibi? That's the stupidest plan I ever heard of. He came this close to killing himself. I was stumped too. But then I realized that wasn't his plan at all. No one would plan to be in a coma. His idea was to get himself arrested so he would be in jail when the bombs were delivered. That's why he tried to lead us on a car chase. He figured he'd be in jail for seven or eight months. He even picked out a terrible lawyer to make sure that he wouldn't get off. But he screwed up and he hit a truck. And then a car, then another car. Brian Babbage stumbled, literally by accident, into the best alibi in the history of crime. I mean, where's your proof? Brian Babbage woke up this morning. I have arranged for all of us to pay him a little visit. This is going to be great. Not you. Mr. Babbage? Maria. Oh, you're awake. It's a miracle. I came as soon as I heard. Sorry about your sister and your brother. Thank you, Maria. The doctor just told me about them. I can't, I can't believe it. I won't stay long. I just wanted to welcome you back, and I brought your mail. What's, what's that? Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry it's to a bomb. Open. Huh? It's a bomb! Get down! Get down! I can't help but wonder what made you think that was a bomb, Mr. Babbage. Brian Babbage, good morning. You're under arrest for the murder of your sister, Amanda. Where is it? I don't know, man. Why don't you look in the cherries? Hey, wait a minute. These napkins are the same. Hey, he said he'd never been there. Who said? The coin dealer. Sorry, Mr. Monk. We gotta go. Up, up and away, Randy. We gotta go. Bye, See ya. Just hurry! It's on Harrison Street, called the Bay City Cafe. You mind telling us what's going on? Gully was right. It's a different city after dark. Who's Gully? He's the guy who stole my wallet. I learned a lot from him. Here's what happened. Nothing I saw was real. It was all a con game. There were three of them, grifters, looking for an easy mark. And they found one, a coin dealer named Jacob Posner. Posner thought he was buying drugs. 
But it was all a show for his benefit. They wanted Posner to think that he was in serious trouble. They told Posner they could cover it up and make it all go away for a price. They were all in on it. The drug dealer, the so-called cop, and the waitress, Zena Davis. They only had a few minutes, but it was enough time to clean up all the blood before I got back. Posner thought he was paying them hush money. He gave them dozens of coins, rare coins. It must have been worth a fortune. He had no idea he'd been conned until later, when we showed up. We mentioned that the dead cop was, in fact, alive and well, and we just had seen him at the train station. Posner realized he'd been conned. Didn't take it very well. That's a hell of a story. I guess I'll be reading all about it tomorrow night. Here we are. Can you go around back? Keep moving. Go. Come on. Come on, come on. Hey, relax, man. You get your coins. You're damn right I will. Just keep walking. Going somewhere? Hello? Hello, can you see me? Yes, Mr. Monk, we can see you. Don't, don't, don't touch anything. No, Mr. Monk, it's fine. Look, here, here I am. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, don't, don't touch it, it's fine. Okay, um, so everybody's here, including the captain. Yeah, yeah, and me, hey, Monk. Is that Randy? What are you wearing? Please tape. Where are you? That's her bedroom. So it would appear. Linda was playing some music, remember? You see, I told you he was stalking me. Now, can't you do anything? Leland! Leland, I've been trying to call you all day. Something I have to show you. I know how she did it. Leland, please, just get me out of here. Please, I can't take this anymore. Let's just go, right now. Let's just go to, go to the airport. We can't leave now. We've got reservations. Oh, forget Hawaii. Let's just... Let's just disappear. We can start over. Maybe, maybe South America, maybe Venezuela. Listen. She did in. I think it's coming from down there. You can turn that off. That's your bedroom. It's not her bedroom. It's a replica. It's a duplicate. Here's what happened. You rented this truck under your maiden name and went to work. You duplicated everything. The furniture, the computer, the curtains, even the pictures. You must have been planning it for months. You began talking to the captain every night from your bedroom at 6.30. Except for last Friday. Last Friday, you were talking from a parking lot a couple of blocks from that house in Novato. From a robot, a uh, satellite. Wireless internet. Whatever. That night, Look what I bought. you chatted with the captain like you always did. You fooled him. You fooled me. You fooled everybody. At 7 o'clock, you signed off and snuck into the house. You knew Sean Corcoran had an appointment there at 7.15. All you had to do was hide and wait. And it worked. Except for the part about the truck getting towed. 
That was a tough break. When were you gonna go pick it up? The next time Leland left town? How did you know? The pen. The night we talked, you put the pen down on the table. I remember. And it rolled a little. But yesterday, in your bedroom, in your real bedroom, it didn't roll. It just stayed there. I couldn't figure it out. And then it hit me. On the night of the murder, your bedroom must have been on a slant. You parked on a hill. I parked on a hill. I'm here to arrest you for the murder of Judge Kate Lavinio. That's a warrant, duly sworn. Sweetheart, I'm gonna have to call you back. Doctor, will you call Howard Klein and tell him we're suing the city for malicious prosecution again? I have hired a local construction company to take out this door. We're gonna get a crane in here and lower your fat ass down to the street. A crane? Oh, that's rich. But would you mind explaining to me how I'm supposed to have killed the bitch? I can't leave this room, remember? Mr. Monk! Well, my, 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 it's the defective detective once more. Lay it on me, Einstein. These two chairs are from the judge's house. The killer stood on one of them when he turned off the smoke alarm. A girl in the neighborhood saw, quote, a very, very fat man standing on it. But there's something funny about the chair. It's not broken. This is Sergeant Cargill from the 14th Precinct. Sergeant, how much do you weigh? 265. Would you mind? So how could a very, very fat man have stood on it? There's only one explanation. He was a fat man, but not a heavy man. Lieutenant. I visited your clinic today and borrowed one of your empathy suits. Fat, but not heavy. I believe we have another warrant to serve. You're joking. You were in it together. You killed her. The fat man planned it, but you did it. It was brilliant. You killed her. And then you left clues behind to make it look like Beiderbeck did it. Why? Because he's the only person on earth who couldn't possibly have done it. You wore enormous boots to leave big footprints. Breaking in was no problem. The housekeeper told you about the hide key. I admit I was confused until I figured out the sequence of events. First, you killed the judge. <coughs> then, you ransacked the house. Of course, you needed a witness. You put on one of your fat suits, set off the alarm, and then waited until you were sure somebody was watching. And finally, you called 911. And you're great with voices, Doc. We've all heard you. It's right downstairs. Biderbeck even supplied you with videotapes of the judge so you could practice. This is insane. Why would I risk everything? Well, you really didn't have a choice. Did you, Glenn? I knew Christiane wasn't your real name as soon as you said you were 37 years old. You told Sharona that you were named after Christiane Barnard, but he wasn't famous until 1967, after you were born. I put the FBI on it. They were looking for you. Your real name is Glenn Q. Sindel. You killed a child five years ago. Accident. You were operating on her so doped up you couldn't see straight. Accident. Convicted of manslaughter and reckless endangerment, you were looking at 15 years minimum. You jumped bail before sentencing, and then you disappeared. Oh, oh. Until now. And somehow, somehow, Beiderbeck learned your secret, and from that moment on, he owned you, didn't he? Listen, I, I just have to say, fantastic work, really. Both of you, kudos. And, and for the record, I am shocked 
shocked that my personal physician is both a fugitive and a cold-blooded killer. Shocked. But you can't really tie me to the crime, can you? Well, now, that really depends on Mr. Sindel. What do you say, Glenn? Would you like to talk to us? It will be my pleasure. I'm looking forward to testifying against you. Maybe once and for all I can redeem myself for everything I've done. All the pain I've caused. I detest you. Do you? With every fiber of my being. Fighter back, you're an abomination. An odious, gluttonous, yeah, yeah. putrid freak of nature. Wow, it's been a long time since anyone's called me that. Listen, by the time my lawyers are through with you, you're not gonna know which end is up. There's not a prison in the country that can hold me. There are very few shopping malls that can hold you. But nonetheless, we're gonna give it a try. What's he doing? I think he's trying to kill me. Wasn't really much of a fight, was it? It's jungle out there. Disorder and confusion everywhere. No one seems to care. Well, I do. Hey, who's in charge here? It's jungle out there.